discussing plans to reform a juvenile jail into a shelter for asylum seekers. We can transform and uplift any space we go into. A first-hand look at how deputies keep narcotics off the streets. The drug smuggling and the narcotic smuggling, they're very, very good at what they do. And hearing longtime advertising executive Ed Ackerley and his latest pitch to become mayor of Tucson. I would stack my resume up against uh, anyone running for mayor. Hello and welcome to Arizona 360. I'm Lorraine Rivera. Thank you for joining us. The organization providing shelter for asylum seekers at Tucson's Benedictine Monastery is preparing for a move in the coming weeks. You'll remember at the start of the year, the monastery's owner opened its doors, inviting Catholic community services to offer aid to migrants in transit through Tucson. With development at the monastery beginning soon, this week Catholic Community Services in Pima County announced plans to relocate to the county's juvenile detention complex. Catholic Community Services Teresa Cavendish and Diego Pina Lopez joined us to discuss the transition and ongoing challenges. Teresa, I want to start with you. Tell me about Catholic Community Services. What's been its mission over the last five years? Well, Catholic Community Services has many missions, but as it relates to the work of the Casalitas program, we came in initially to just provide support to the community as it was rallying to work with the families that were being left at the Greyhound bus station by ICE and Border Patrol. And over time, we were able to to add more to that. We were able to add some volunteer coordination, some additional facilities. We're now uh, much deeper into the community on a lot of, of different sites through partner organizations and through two houses that we own and then now working over at the monastery for the next few weeks. And Diego, you've been overseeing day-to-day -day operations at the monastery. You told me since October you've worked with 14,000 people who have come through the doors? Yes, 14,000 people with uh, so many different backgrounds, stories to share as well as needs and resources. So we were able to meet most, you know, everyone's needs that come through the door and kind of learn a little bit more about the issues that are going on in Central America and across the world, really. These are individuals who have just made a very long trek. They've been filtered through the federal government. Now they're with you. What exactly are they getting when they come to the monastery? What are their needs? In the morning, Teresa and I get phone calls from ICE and Border Patrol letting us know what they're wanting to release for the day. And we're making sure to meet the initial need to make sure that no one is dropped off at the bus station. So within ourselves and partner organizations, we meet that need. When families first arrive, we check that they have medicine, their medicines, their money, their belongings, and then we welcome them inside to our, the monastery. And then from there, we do a medical check, resources they need for like missing persons, as well as any shock that they may be experiencing. From there, we really encourage choice. So they can go get clothing for themselves, take a shower, rest, set up their transportation. Uh, everyone has sponsors in the United States, so they can call their sponsors, their families back home in Central America or across the globe, as well as um, do what they need to do. Talk to the Guatemalan consulate or ask us for other services as well that they need. There were some challenges toward the end of this time here yeah. at the monastery. Yes. yes, so some of the challenges we faced was the plumbing going down. So essentially, there is no more showers or bathrooms within the facility, so we've been really fortunate that uh, Diggins and Sons has donated porta potties for us. We've been really fortunate that uh, the, some par uh, parishes have donated time to build portable showers. Um, and St. Andrews and Presbyterian. St. And Andrews Presbyterian donated their portable showers as well. So we've been really fortunate that the community has recognized our need for plumbing and has stepped up <laughs> on essentially giving us that plumbing. You know, our problems early on with you know how large the facility is and for the safety of the families, making sure that we know what was going on in each hallway, to be able to build uh, resources for the families. And you know, every so often we need a butter knife to open a locked door yeah. for the families. It's a quirky building. It's a quirky it's, building. It's a beautiful building, but it's quirky. Yeah. Early on in this conversation, there was concern about how families were treated where they were housed. In this case, we're moving from a monastery to a former juvenile jail. Concerned about the optics that it, this presents? Um, I think I am less concerned about the optics because we already have the vision in place. We know what this will look like inside. And really the, the work of Casa Elitas is, is what brings the spirit, is what brings the warmth, um, what, what brings the welcoming. We were very fortunate to have the monastery, which kind of had magic in its walls. But really it's about, 
it's about this this effort, the volunteers and the work itself. We can transform and uplift any space we go into. We already have visions of how it will look and it will take a lot of work, but it will be amazing. Given that we've had some time to look back and, and mm -hmm. think, okay, this is manageable, we've been able to do it, what's the picture look like for the future? I think that's anyone's guess. Uh, we know that right now there's been a small lull in the number of folks that are coming into the United States across the entire southwestern border. And nobody actually believes that's going to be sustained. And I think I'm, um, I might be speaking out of turn, but having spoken to, to ICE, Border Patrol, Customs and Border Protection, we just believe that this is a, a brief respite before the push begins again. And so our, our future, what does, what, is, what does the need look like? It looks, it looks like what we're doing right now. Um, there was a time about eight weeks ago where we had over 700 individuals in shelter here in Tucson, and it wasn't enough. And Border Patrol was pushed to a place that they had to do a street release after that, and that's when the county and the city joined us in their in our efforts and have remained as very good partners with us since that point. So uh, whether we have 100 people in shelter in the community at the moment, we know that uh, that our capacity and our need for 800 is really where we're going. And so we have to have that ability to spin up to that level. Okay, my thanks to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. An initiative to make Tucson a sanctuary city is likely to appear on the ballot this November. Supporters say they submitted nearly twice the number of signatures required. The People's Defense Initiative is leading the campaign, motivated in part by an opposition to SB 1070, a state law signed in 2010 that requires law enforcement to verify a person's immigration status in certain circumstances. We asked Executive Director Zyra Livelier to explain what the initiative would change. There's a lot of different protections against uh, racial profiling. We have um, uh, an expediting process for certification for U visas, which you can apply for if you are an un undocumented uh, migrant who is a victim of a crime and reports the crime to the police and helps the police solve that crime. You can apply for a U visa, which gives you a uh, job permit and protection from deportation. We know from speaking to the community and um, to uh, immigration lawyers that this process often takes months, if not years, if not ever. We have it so that they have to um, review that certification within 90 days. Let's say there's an undocumented immigrant in the city of Tucson mm -hmm. and it's a sanctuary city. Right. How is life different for them? In so many ways, uh, but again, always reverting back to SB 1070. SB 1070, the, the worst parts of SB 1070 still exist. And the worst parts are that every police officer is by de facto an immigration agent. So any time that an, uh, an undocumented migrant or someone in a mixed status family needs to call the police or gets pulled over, comes into contact with a police officer, they're risking uh, detention and possible deportation. So what makes it different is that we put in as many roadblocks as we possibly can. We squeeze SB 1070 to its limit um, to make it safer and more uh, secure for undocumented migrants to come into contact with police to report a crime if they need to. And those are just a few of the uh, small, of the many new policies that we're looking to put into place. The initiative could face legal challenges, according to a memo from Tucson City Attorney Mike Rankin. It details potential conflicts with SB 1070, possibly triggering another statute, SB 1487. If the Attorney General determines a city ordinance breaks state law, SB 1487 lets Arizona suspend its shared revenue with that city, unless it repeals or changes the ordinance in question. Livier disputes this premise. But 1487 pertains to laws passed by city officials. This is a citizen-led initiative which has its own special protections and 1487 is absolutely silent on citizen-led initiatives which have by Arizona Constitution its own set of rules and laws. It makes it much stronger than say an ordinance or a law passed by the city electeds. Uh, so 
for one, we're absolutely sure that we wrote this initiative to withstand a challenge. The state cannot just pull their funding, um, but we do believe that when the fight comes, and whatever the fight may cost, it is absolutely worth it. Uh, how many of our community members are worth it? Um, the well-being of our community is absolutely worth it. Let's say it fails, mm -hmm. what becomes of the movement and the people behind it, like yourself? Uh, we continue. Uh, you know, the thing about what you would call a movement is that we didn't decide to just run a sanctuary city initiative for the win of it. Uh, we've decided to run this for the idea of it, the idea of direct democracy, the idea of giving people the power to pass their own ordinances, to fight for themselves, to defend themselves. People's Defense Initiative was born out of that idea. Um, and we're already in conversations across the state with other groups and uh, elected officials who want to pass an ordinance like this, the long-term goal being the, uh, to rescind SB 1070 completely. Okay, mm -hmm. Zaira from the People's Defense Initiative, thank you so much. Thank you. While this isn't a headline you'll see each week, there's an ongoing effort in Pima County to prevent illegal drug sales. So far this year, the Sheriff's Department has had a hand in seizing drugs worth nearly $3.5 million on the street. Everything from meth to fentanyl and cocaine. It's something we got to see firsthand with the Pima County Sheriff's Department's Border Interdiction Unit. Our glimpse into border crime began earlier this spring. We rode with Sergeant Patrick Hilliker, a 23-year veteran of the force. Being on this job for so long, when it comes to thefts and burglaries and, and, and car thefts and everything that will disrupt our community and, and we're trying to make it safer, will have some kind of drug nexus, usually has some kind of drug nexus why it's coming in. He's one of the leaders of Pima County's Border Interdiction Unit, a specialized team of deputies focused on transnational crime. It deploys on highways and rural roads. On this particular day, we were along I-10. I-10 is a major route to get both north and, and east in this country, and a lot of, <clears throat> a lot of narcotic smuggling is, is on this route. And a lot of the times the narcotics even stays here and will stay here until it gets moved around the country. Sometimes it'll go to Phoenix, sometimes it'll stay here, sometimes it'll just come through and go directly towards other places in the United States. But there are plenty, there is a lot of times where it's held here until it gets distributed. I've been on ride-alongs where it's in cars, vans, semis. Is that still happening where it can be any vehicle on this in front of us and there could be something nefarious going on? The narcotic smuggling industry and these drug trafficking organizations are very good at what they do. Um, they will find a way to get it up here. The crisis has been ongoing and they will, they will find any way and different ways um, to get the uh, narcotics up here, whether it's in cars, trains, semis, walking, any way you can think of, they've thought of a way to get it in here. I mean. It's shipped, it's shipped around the country. It's hit anywhere you can probably think of, they've probably thought of it in smuggling uh, the narcotics up here. Inside the county's evidence room, Hilliker and his team showed us a recent bust. More than 200 oxy pills laced with fentanyl and 12 pounds of meth, all hidden in compartments of this trunk. According to Hilliker, the driver was headed out of town on Oracle Road. Sitting on the table, it doesn't look like a lot, but. Uh, um, 12 pounds of meth is quite a bit for somebody to be running out of here. And obviously to us, it seemed like it was going out of town. So it was going somewhere else in the United States. More than likely, a lot of the stuff that comes through here goes back east. Um, I can't tell you exactly where it was going, but at least it didn't get there and somebody's not putting, putting this in their body. That's for sure. Hilliker says busts like this one happen weekly. Our camera was with a border interdiction unit during a traffic stop on I-10. Inside this truck, deputies found nine pounds of cocaine wrapped in a gift bag. The drug smuggling and the narcotic smuggling, they're very, very good at what they do. And it is extremely hard to try and find this stuff because they know how to hide it. They know how to have stories to tell. They know how to talk to us. More than 20 years experience for you in Pima County law enforcement. Has this always been an issue? Is it getting worse? How would you rate it? I would say it's always been a, 
it's always been a huge issue. I mean, there. Ever since I've been a cop, there's, you know, just because of where we're at on the border as well as two, there's always been narcotics coming through here. For the most part, the the narcotics have always been coming through here, and at an astronomical rate. It is. It's almost unbelievable how much comes through here and the amount that we do is trying to do as much as we can for it. It's a small piece on working with everybody to try and deter as much as we can because there's so much coming through here. You just said unbelievable and I mean you've been doing this for more than 20 years. You're still impressed by what you see happening on, on the highways and in our community? Yes ma'am. It is I don't think it's slowed down. I think it's, and then it, what happens is, you know, certain drugs might get more popular or more wanted. So you'll see an increase in those. And, you know, when it comes to heroin or the cocaine or in uh, meth, and we've seen increases and decreases in each one, but the total of them all just never seem to go down. It's just whatever's more prevalent at the time goes up. And then when one goes down, one comes up and it's just a constant flow and it's, it's hard to say how much comes through here because we get quite a bit, but we know it's not that much in the big, big scheme of things. And I believe wholeheartedly and passionately that we are out here at least making some kind of difference. If we can stop one load from going somewhere here in Tucson or somewhere in the rest of the United States, to me, it's all worthwhile and we're doing the right thing. And it is absolutely public safety and saving lives to try and keep this garbage off the street. What we saw with our ride along with the Sheriff's Department reveals how law enforcement seizes drugs on a day to day basis. Our next discussion focuses on some of the lasting challenges involved with staying ahead of the issues that stem from drug abuse. We brought together Captain Jeffrey Palmer, commander of the Sheriff's Department's Criminal Investigations Division, and Stacy Cope, program director of Sonoran Prevention Works, which helps people with substance abuse. I want to begin with you, Captain Palmer. We saw a piece with Sergeant Helliker out in the streets. I mean, this is an issue that has just continued to, as you said, evolve over the years. Well, it really has. Uh, you know, not a day goes by where there isn't product being moved on our thoroughfares and our streets in Pima County. Uh, we have taken a collaborative approach to uh, try to interdict and disrupt uh, the, the flow of drugs in our community. Uh, but you saw firsthand how, how that shakes out, and it is something that uh, occurs every day. And you work with a number of agencies in law enforcement to get cases like these underway, investigated, and hopefully prosecuted. Uh, we do. We, we partner with uh, both our state, local, and federal partners. And uh, we, we take that shared collaborative approach because uh, those resources uh, in information sharing, uh, it, it, it comes into play when we, we share assets, share resources, share information. Yeah, you can't do it alone. Stacy, you work with people who have substance abuse addiction, and it's hard for them to get off. What, what are some of the challenges that you're seeing in your line of work? Ooh, lots. Um, I think the go-to answer is that there's, we need more treatment, um, but I would argue that, and the data shows us that most people are not in a place where they are ready for treatment, um, have access to treatment, can afford treatment, can afford to leave their homes and their jobs to go into treatment. Um, so often treatment isn't the only answer and abstinence is not the only goal. And so our job is to practice a harm reduction approach, which says that there are lots of ways to show up for people with substance use disorder and people who are using drugs um, outside of a traditional treatment model, making sure that people are safe, that they have the tools and resources that they need in order to stay alive. And if we could sort of shame or arrest or punish our way out of this problem, we would have done so by now. Um, so we know that that's not the issue. It's really making sure that there's like a, a humanness and a compassion for why this person is in this situation and the patience and understanding of why it's so challenging for somebody to transition out of that. As you've said, there's also laws on the books though that you have to enforce. So it is a delicate balance between treating something that may be going on behind the scenes and then enforcing what exists to make our community safe. Well, sure, uh, as, as I stated, it's a community problem and it takes a multi-pronged approach uh, with all community stakeholders. Uh, we are a public safety agency. We have laws to enforce, uh, but that doesn't mean we do so without compassion. Uh, and a sensitivity to our, our citizens that we serve. I noticed on the ride along that there's a bit of a humanitarian approach to the work. And Stacy, you noted that 
Pima County Sheriff's Department now has Narcan available um, for deputies to use out in the field. Mm -hmm. um, Sergeant Helker also made it a point to say that, you know, we have to just talk with people, find out where they're going, what they're up to, so that we can really understand what's going on in a case. Have you seen a shift in law enforcement over the years to just approach it differently? It has been an evolution, uh, certainly. Uh, the drug trade has evolved. You mentioned it's a, a billion dollar industry. Uh, it certainly is. It's not listed on Forbes 100, uh, but it, it's, it's a billion dollar business. Uh, and it's probably a top 15 or top 20 uh, industry in our country. Uh, an illegal one nonetheless, but uh, certainly it's impactful. When I first came on 25 years ago, what we were seeing majority of was, was bulk marijuana. We've certainly seen a shift in that. We, we hardly ever see uh, marijuana in bulk these days. It's hydro coming out of California uh, with a higher THC content and the harder drugs, uh, the controlled substances and the imitation drugs, uh, synthetics, fentanyl, those types of things. So certainly it has evolved. Are we making gains in tackling this issue? Or are we having the right conversations? Well, I'm gonna go back to that evolution process. I think we are, are making gains, uh, but it is, uh, it's a cat and mouse game. Uh, we are in the interdiction business and uh, uh, the drug cartels and the distributors are in the business of not being caught. So, uh, Stacy, are the right conversations being had? I mean, there's, is there a different approach at this? I mean, if, if we really wanted to look at the bigger picture, then uh, if it's a cat and mouse game on supply, then we should be talking about demand. Why are people using drugs? Why are people selling drugs? And if we want to see real change in that, then we have to have other options for people to make money, have other options for people to deal with their trauma, have other options for people to feel connected to society. Um, so these are not overnight easy um, solutions or policies to put in place, um, but certainly drugs aren't going anywhere, that's clear. Um, so if we, if we wanted to make a larger impact, I would say that we would need to address the reasons why people find themselves in these situations. Okay, there's supply and demand for sure. All right, my thanks to both of you. Thank you. Certainly. Continuing with our city election coverage, in less than a month, ballots begin arriving in mailboxes for Tucson's mayoral race. All four candidates told us they oppose the sanctuary initiative we explored earlier. We have featured interviews with the three Democrats on the primary ballot. Next month's winner will face independent Ed Ackerley in the general election. Ackerley is a longtime advertising executive in his first run for office. What would you say is the single biggest issue facing Tucson? Roads. I think the one thing that comes up in every single uh, event I go to is fix our roads. Our roads are in terrible shape. And so I think as mayor and council, that's the one thing that uh, we have direct control over, the funds that come in. And I think that's the biggest issue on people's minds is fix the roads. It's, I talk about it that it's the one thing that we all have in common. And we all drive on the same roads and we all experience them every single day. And so it becomes a, a big issue. Other big issues, but that's the biggest one. You're running as an independent. Why you, why not the other guys? Well, I think uh, three things. One is uh, my experience. Although I've never run for political office before, I would stack my resume up against uh, anyone running for mayor. And the number of uh, community groups and organizations that I've led over, been in business for 44 years, I've led a, wrote checks and, and had to balance a checkbook. So I think that the leadership side of my, and my degree is in leadership, educational leadership. So. I have a great uh, leadership pedigree. Second thing I would say is, is that I'm born here, raised here, been here all my life, 60 years, and I've uh, enjoyed a great life in Tucson, and I wanted to contribute something meaningful to that. And I think that experience over that time has given me a great insight into what Tucsonans want and what the area needs for the future. And third, I think it's time. I think people are looking for something different in politics. I think they've experienced uh, a 7-0 Democrat Council for the last uh, several years. I think uh, we've been turning a little bit left and that's okay from time to time, but I think people are thinking now maybe we need to go forward instead of turning left. So those would be the three main reasons. And that brings me to my next question. Because his, Tucson has historically been a Democrat-led council, how likely is it that someone like yourself could get into that position and bring everyone together to effect change? Well, I do think that the council has been operating as a cohesive group because they have a 7-0 uh, Democratic uh, 
group together. But I think of its importance is for us to look more regionally and look at the other municipalities that surround us. The RTA is a good example. Rio Nuevo is even a, a good example, Sun Corridor. I think that, the, uh, that what, we, what we can look for is uh, um, collaboration, moving forward as a team, um, maybe looking at things from another perspective, maybe giving a little bit more business perspective on some of the priorities that we've uh, been, the initiatives that we've had. I think I want to be the chief marketing officer of Tucson. I want to tell people why I chose to stay here for 60 years, why I want my grandchildren to live in a community that's wonderful and exciting and, and cutting edge. And I think, that's, I think that's what people are looking for is the future. What can we do to make sure that we point Tucson into the future? That's economic development, that's safety, that's transportation, that's water, that's all those municipal issues that we talk about. How do you feel about sanctuary cities? Because there has been an attempt to, to see if it can be moved through in this community. I believe that Tucson is a welcoming community and has been for hundreds of years. I, I do not agree with the uh, initiative that's being floated that is perhaps to uh, codify the fact that Tucson would become a sanctuary city. I think it does two things. One, it goes against the city charter, which we would have to change the city charter. I don't believe that's a good thing. And secondly, it, uh, to coin a phrase, it handcuffs our, our local law enforcement officials to not interact with federal law enforcement officials. And that might be okay for a particular issue, but that's not good for the overall safety of our community. On a third point, I just think that once you say something like, we're this kind of a city or we're this kind of a city, or you, the number one industry other than government in Tucson is tourism. And if we tell half of the community or half of the nation, uh, by the way, don't come to Tucson because we're this kind of a city, we've then cut off the economic engine that pays for all the social services that helps us fund uh, help for people that need it. So it's almost, uh, it, it doesn't really make any economic sense to say that we're a sanctuary city because then we're telling a lot of people that disagree with that not to come to Tucson. So I think we can do it in other ways. I think the the Opportunity Center of Opportunity on Palo Verde is a good example of how we can come together as a community and solve these uh, problems with immigrants and homelessness and so forth. And I don't, I don't think Sanctuary Cities is the answer. Okay, Ed, thank you. Thank you. If you missed our interviews with the other candidates, you can find them all online at azpm.org slash Arizona360. They share their top priorities for the city of Tucson. That's all for now. Thanks for joining us. Share your feedback and let us know what you think by visiting us on social media or email at Arizona360 at azpm.org. We'll see you next week.